Hello, I'm Jeff Shazinski with the Natural, National Center for Appropriate Technology. I'm an agricultural natural resource economist. Today, I'm going to be talking about insurable risk reduction for diversified vegetable production in the Northeast. So hopefully all of these things will work <laughs> in terms of technical deals, but here we go. First of all, the National Center for Appropriate Technology has been around for a long time. It um, was founded in 1976, has a 47 year history. The three major areas we work on are sustainable energy, sustainable agriculture, and broadly sustainable communities. I've been happy to be part of this organization for almost 19 years. Um, we also, under a cooperative agreement with the USDA, Rural Development um, Agency, uh, run the ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program for the USDA. We've been doing this uh, under a corporate agreement since 1987, and a 36-year history. And this is a uh, screenshot of our most recently updated um, website, which is filled, which will where you'll be able to see this presentation and uh, also all the many of the resources I refer to can be uh, attained by going to this site encourage you to go there. There's lots of things available for farmers and ranchers throughout the country. Outline of this, of this talk will be, um, basically I'm gonna start with introduction and talk about risk and what insurable, and insurable risk and the differences. I'm gonna get in some crop insurance basics. I'm gonna be assessing how, insure, how to assess risk in your area, right down to the county level. And I'll do a brief case study of whole farm revenue uh, with a particular attention to a new part of that policy called the micro -dendum. And I'll have some tools and resources available for more understanding. So risk, um, I think many of us know what risk is and I would, um, um, offer the uh, idea that farming is very risky. Um, it's probably one of the more riskier occupations out there because you depend on what? The weather and markets. And in many cases, you have control over neither. So are you generally a risk averse or are you risk tolerant? Um, are you a gambler or not so much a gambler? Um, most farmers, um, are a little bit risk tolerant. They have to be, again, to be farmers and ranchers. Uh, but there's a relative amount of risk aversion in, in all people. One way to think of this is, is that if you uh, didn't have to, uh, many people have to have insurance, homeowner insurance if they have a mortgage, but if you didn't have to, and I don't any longer, uh, would I still buy homeowner's insurance even if I didn't have to? Or... If I didn't have to buy car insurance, which is mostly mandated now, uh, would I still buy it? And the answer to that question would probably put you um, on a scale of some, whether you're risk tolerant or risk averse. Um, I'm considering not buying homeowner's insurance because I know the probability of major consequences occurring to my home are fairly low and it's expensive. And so I'm willing to take the risk and maybe eliminate risks in other ways. Um, and that's another important point. Insurance is only one way to manage risk. Uh, and in fact, in the Northeast, which is the general area of this discussion today, uh, many farmers do not um, take crop insurance, um, partly because the policies offered aren't as, 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 aren't, as, as, um, aren't as good as they are for, for other parts of the country. And they often have high levels of diversity in their cropping and livestock systems. And, they think of that diversity as being a form of risk conversion, which it is. So insurance, you know, particularly federal crop insurance, which we'll be talking about here, is, is just one way to manage risk. So what are the risks of farming? Uh, there's something that the insurance, crop insurance people talk about multiple perils or multiple peril insurance, which has to do with drought, floods, tornadoes, Yes, indeed, volcanic activity in Hawaii, and it's a serious issue. Volcanoes erupt and they can, um, the ash can uh, 
destroy crops, um, not to mention burn them up in some cases. Um, and that one is often thought of as a yield risk because obviously if your crops get destroyed by, buried by volcanic ash, um, and your, your yields are going to be very low. <laughs> in fact, they'll be zero. Uh, so that, that's one source. And that's one I think people most often think of. But another risk is that the price of product changes. When you plant the crop, it has, you generally know what the price might be in the market. And by the time you're ready to sell it, there might be a significant change in that price. And in fact, as a cause of loss, uh, change in price is a significant source of risk in U.S. agriculture. Another one is the price of your inputs change. Now, this doesn't happen too often, too frequently, but right now, for instance, uh, synthetic fertilizer prices have uh, are rapidly have rapidly increased and are very, very high, uh, historically high. And of course, that means for this coming year, you know, your cost of production has changed. And therefore, if your costs are higher and the price of the product doesn't change appropriately, you have, again, another source of risk that your input prices, the cost of your inputs change. Um, this is less uh, immediately of importance, but a cost of borrowing changes to the extent that a farmer needs an operating loan every year um, or in some years, that cost of that loan can, can vary. Um, we have programs for the FSA that have fairly low, low cost operating loans, but in terms of interest, but nonetheless, it is a, a risk and can change. Um, rules and regulations, food safety can cause all kinds of changes in terms of cost of production and paperwork and time and management, and they, they can change. And as they change, they, they uh, open you to another source of economic risk. And of course, health and personal injury are significant in agriculture. Um, and there, there is insurance for personal injury and people also coming out to your farm. But uh, when we have publications on, on that area of insurance, but that's not going to be the discussion of this, uh, this uh, video today. Um, in terms of crop insurance basics, I'm gonna explore a little bit the jargon uh, um, I, as you'll know, I'll start using words that may not be commonly used by folks. Uh, and that's because I've spent oh, 18 years studying crop insurance and watching it change over the years. And uh, I got used to the jargon, and many of us do um, that, that work in this area, but I know that's not necessarily the jargon that you're used to. So I'll try to be careful there. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the federally subsidized crop insurance program. Um, there are crop insurance policies that are entirely private that are not subsidized by the federal government and uh, they are available. But today I'm going to, the proponent of uh, crop insurance, uh, and this, it goes beyond crops, it goes to livestock as well. Um, even though we generically refer to it as crop insurance. Um, I'm only going to be talking about those policies that are federally uh, uh, subsidized and, and are created by the federal government, which are the bulk of them used by farmers and ranchers in the United States. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about the public and private system of crop insurance, how that works in the United States. It's a little bit unusual. Um, and the dominance of the commodity crops in the crop insurance part. And, 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 and a, and a kind of a, an issue of who benefits from crop insurance the most in terms of the agricultural sector broadly. So we have different kinds of risk. One is, of course, I referred to already yield risk that includes risk associated with risk, those multiple peril things, those volcanic activities, those floods, those storms or hurricanes, they affect your yield. And in many cases, their insurance is available only for yield they're going yield insurance, not again for other things. Now, revenue risk is a bit unusual and the term is not often used that way, but it's where you combine the risks of yield and price. And for most of the major uh, commodity crops, we they often have what's called revenue protection. And revenue protection protects both from the change in yield that could occur from apparel or that can change 
from the change in price from the beginning when you plant and, and then when you harvest, that, that risk of price change is covered by a revenue policy. But as we will see, revenue policies aren't available in every county in the United States for all crops. Um, and in fact, a few crops dominate. The risk management agency is the agency in the federal government that essentially on a day-to-day -day basis is kind of um, watching and is the, uh, the public part of the crop insurance program uh, with this agency charged with implementing the crop insurance programs. They're overseen by the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's just a board, a governing board that uh, makes fundamental changes in the, the types of policies and the way they're administered through the risk management agency. There are also approved insurance providers. Now this I think is not well known by many folks that there are only really 13 companies currently selling federal crop insurance products. And they also sell, as I said, private products. They, there are agents often either associated with this AIP or insurance provider, and we tend to use that acronym AIP. Uh, agents usually work through one of these countries, but there are independent agents that can work through other companies. So when you go to your crop insurance agents, they may be, they are generally, if they're telling, selling you a federal crop program, uh, are going to be associated with one of these 13 companies. Liability, I think people understand that, but that's the value of what is, of what is insured. It's rarely, if never really, 100% for crop insurance. There is usually always some kind of deductible, although with many addendum products, um, you can get up to like 95% of a revenue risk, for instance, protected by crop insurance. That's pretty high level of uh, protection. Uh, indemnities, that might be a term not as well often used or understood is the value of the payout for an insurable loss. So when you make a claim and it's adjusted and reviewed, then uh, a payout is made to you and that's called your indemnity payment in crop insurance jargon. And the premium, of course, I think we all know what those are, is the cost of the insurance. And again, uh, the farmer only pays part of the premium cost because um, crop insurance is highly subsidized. So it, the federal crop insurance program is a public-private system. And this is a nice little diagram. And, and, and see, we have the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation on the bottom there. And it says operated by RMA. It's not exactly operated by the RMA actually um, has to go before the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation if it's making any major, it, in a sense, it reports to the federal so the governing board of the federal crop insurance really is the controlling governing body. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the RMA is running the program with the help of the AIPs, the private insurance companies you see there in the middle. And then of course there's farmers and ranchers who are the recipients and use these policies. So the farmer um, pays a portion of the total premium to the insurance companies, and then those are forwarded to the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation or to RMA into actually a giant bank uh, because we have to make payouts. And so those premiums are collected and then indemnities and payouts are paid out. Um, the relationship between the Federal Crop Insurance and RMA is, is basically the federal government pays these private insurance companies and thereby through their agents, uh, some administrative and operating costs. It's a, it's a sense of subsidy to, to those for, for administering and, and selling and, and, and take, you know, essentially the interaction with the farmer is, is he gets, they get covered administrative costs for doing so. Uh, when revenue or production falls below a certain threshold, farmers receive an indemnity payment. Sometimes though, however, more is collected in premiums than is paid out in indemnities and that's called an underwriting gain. And what is interesting in this public private system is that the companies, the 13 private companies, share in that underwriting gain in any given year. Now, technically the, the federal crop insurance program is supposed to run such that on average, the premiums are set such that 
the no more is paid out in indemnities than is collected in premiums. But we know in many years you cannot make that perfectly, and in some years there's lots of losses. So in fact, you end up paying out more than you take in. In some years, it's the opposite. You take in more than you pay out. When that situation occurs, there's a gain, and that gain is shared. So that's another way in which the private companies uh, benefit from the crop, from being participating in the federal crop insurance. They share it underwriting gains. And here's a quick uh, look at a diagram that shows you some of the more recent. Uh, it's not, haven't found and haven't updated it to the current year, but this is through 2019. It gives you a sense of what's going on here. And you'll see that, for instance, in fiscal year 2010, the uh, net payments to farmers were less, and there was a tremendous amount of underwriting gain. In fact, um, way more was gained in terms, in other words, more was um, taken in and paid out in that significantly more in terms of the whole program. And then you can see it changed in the next year. And then in 2012, it's extremely almost the opposite way. In fact, the 2012 season was a significantly, uh, in my lifetime and career, um, it was one of the times where we, we had the most wrecks, so to speak, ever in terms of nationwide. You know, usually some parts of the country do better, but this was a, a time when everyone uh, was, and I kind of remember it, if you remember it, there were some serious issues with production and therefore there was a lot of payout, uh, way more payout. In fact, it was a negative underwriting gain, which means I think even one of the IPs was about to go bankrupt because of the situation where there was essentially, they didn't take in enough to pay out and uh, had to be um, essentially bailed out by the federal government to keep going. Uh, and then you can see this just keeps changing. And to the extent you have the dark, those are the significant underwriting gains. Uh, so means that the private companies that essentially work for the federal government, um, you know, kind of share in the risk, but also have significant uh, gains made uh, on any given year. Uh, and, and therefore, um, you know, they, it's, a, it's a system that greatly benefits the private companies as well as the farmer. So to give you some idea of the magnitude of loss, um, this is last year. I mean, it's as of 12, 27, uh, there's still probably some payouts being made. So this data, it's called the summary of, of uh, it's an indemnity loss map. You can get these and they come out every so often, I think monthly or bi-monthly. And it gives you a sense of the level of losses. And as you see the dark red, uh, and the unit of analysis of crop insurance is county. It's interesting. In, some counties you'll have an, an available policy and county right next door, you might not. So you, uh, you really have to think in terms of the level of counties. So these are the 3000 plus counties in the United States. And these are the lost payments or the indemnities, the payouts made in last year's season. And you can have success some significant losses. If you look at very, very dark, we're talking, there is a county in the United States, probably in Texas, or maybe up there in North Dakota, where $156 million in that one county were paid out in losses. So this gives you a sense of, you know, where losses occurred last year. And of course it varies, but um, you'll see these different regions. Uh, I'm from Montana and you see that it's called the high line of Montana, kind of goes across to North Dakota as well. Is a very risky place to grow and often has uh, high levels of indemnity payouts. Um, and you can see the drought in California in the Central Valley, there were very, very extensive uh, payouts and losses. So, again, the magnitude um, in 2021, um, I didn't put 2022 because it's not quite over yet, but you had $136 billion in, in entities paid in that single year. Um, 13.6 billion in premiums were collected. 8.6 of that was subsidized, 63%. And if you look over the years, that's generally the level of subsidized premiums in the last 10 or so years. It's around 63, 60%, 64%. It varies a little year to year, but significant amount of public taxpayer dollars subsidizes the cost of insurance, something that's not very well known by your average person. We don't realize that 63% of farmers and ranchers insurance is paid 
for the premiums are paid for by uh, UNI's taxpayers. Um, and there was $5.3 billion in indemnities in that year and, and 8.3 in net gains. So, so this was a year again where there was significant uh, more paid in that was, than was paid out. And the other thing that's important to note about the crop insurance broadly is does that really four or five crops really, really dominate the, the, the system. Corn revenue policies and yield policies, soybeans, cotton, wheat, pastures, an interesting one that's actually been moving up in terms of its, uh, its uh, dominance in the whole program. Um, that's called for forage rain and rainfall index. It's an unusual thing and it's, it's becoming more popular and it is really relates to those who graze, to grazers, because it's a, it's a policy that is, is when there's forage losses, the inability to, to have forage for your, your ruminants, it uh, pays out uh, those losses that occur from generally from weather. Um, and sorghum, rice, apples, whole farm revenue production is a unique policy. We'll, get, we'll talk about that. But, and it, it's fairly significant. But you can see, you take the top four or five, and even the top two, you've got uh, see that's fifty-seven percent of all the total premiums and are paid two crops. So, so the commodity crops definitely dominate the public crop insurance program. And unfortunately for the Northeast, which is a region which tends to have greater specialty crops, fruits, vegetables, trees, dry fruit, horticulture, and nursery. Um, We'll see that later when we get to some case studies. But um, these are these are not served well by crop insurance. Um, it's not to say that there are certain counties where, you know, there's a county, for instance, in North Carolina, where a product, a herbal product called Clary Sage, actually has an insurance policy. So in specific counties, you might have fairly significant single commodity-based products. In that case, a yield product, a yield risk for clary sage. But generally speaking, these aren't available uh, broadly. So if you just look at the numbers, and I'm using uh, the ag statistics, uh, census of ag uh, work, because it's probably our best source of data. Uh, we had something like 242 specialty crop farmers. They uh, had a market value of almost $88 billion. But if you look at the liability, you know, the value of all the specialty crops covered under that program in that same year, is only about 8.8 billion. So really only about 3.2% of the potential, potential losses that could come to this crop is covered by crop insurance. I think this is not appreciated to the degree to which crop insurance is not serving specialty crop farmers. And another issue, it gets more into the issues of equity and who benefits the most. Um, another thing that uh, has recently, this is work done by uh, Dr. Eric Belasco at Montana State University, who I've worked with over the years, a good colleague of mine on, on many projects, um, did a recent study with the National Sustainable Ag Coalition uh, regarding, and it, it just to give you a sense of uh, how much benefits. Um, if we basically limited it, farmers and ranchers, those who use the system to only a maximum of $50,000 in subsidies. In other words, once you hit $50,000 in subsidization of your crop insurance, you would have to pay the full cost of it. That would only, only impact about 3.53% of American farms. So you can see it's highly skewed. Uh, the benefits of crop insurance both go to a few crops and only go significantly to, to a few very large farms. Uh, and so there's calls in the farm bill this year. There's been some effort to try to reform that uh, and basically to something like progressive taxation to argue that those who have larger and have larger incomes can, can, can afford and could afford to pay more uh, may be less subsidized uh, by the program. So we could say public dollars, for instance, and maybe serve the smaller farm who is in greater need. It's an equity issue uh, and will likely be discussed. 
an upcoming farm bill uh, for the 2023 farm bill that is going on right now. So now I'm going to turn to assessing insurable risk where you are. Uh, this is a simple case study um, for this presentation. It's a five acre farm, <laughs> very small, relatively small, has 10 different products, uh, and it has an expected gross revenue of about $170,000 in insurance, insurable uh, crops, uh, located in Cheshire County, New Hampshire. So this is the case I'm going to be talking about now, um, which I think is relatively representative of the New England uh, area, which is, again, the focus of this of this effort, of this video, and this educational program. Um, so what crops are insured in New Hampshire, first of all? And now I'm going to go to this website, and uh, hopefully this is going to be recorded and shared because we've had issues with this, but here we go. So now I'm at what's called the Summary of Business of the United States Department of Risk Management HC website, a great website, I go check it out. And the Summary of Business just gives you a lot of data and pretty frequent data on, um, on basically the types of policies and sold and um, how many losses and payment of that indemnity map is part of that. It's basically the business that's going on. And so you have crops by various years, um, by, you can have a national summary, um, I'm kind of interested in the national summary by state and crop. Um, well, let's go by, by, by state. I think this is the one I want. I'm going to go here. So let's look at, let's just look at 2021 since 2022 data might not be fully done. I click there and I get this report. And then as I scroll down this report, I can go to New Hampshire, and it gives me a sense of what was insured in 2021 uh, in the state of New Hampshire. So you have to ask the question of what was insured in New Hampshire in 2021. You can do this for 2022 and, and previous years, but let's go. We're down to Nebraska, New Jersey, and now New Hampshire should be coming up here. Ooh, I went too fast. Um, let's go a little bit. Can't can't get my alphabet correct. <laughs> New Hampshire, there we are. So in New Hampshire, it splits across two stages. Um, we have um, oh, this is the wrong one. This is these are the different types. So this is the yield insurance. We want to we want to look at the one by cap. So I'm going to go and close this off here, and I'm going to go back to by state and crop. Let's go to 2022. But you can see it's the same thing. Now we're looking at states, but we're also looking at the crops insured, which is will answer the question. That was a side trip through the data. Um, here we go down to New Hampshire again, Colorado, Idaho, and Indiana, Maryland. We're getting closer. Minnesota, Alaska. New Hampshire, here we are, New Hampshire. New Hampshire again does split two pages. Okay, so what was insured in New Hampshire in 2022? We have apples, and APH means actual production history. Some of these things, don't worry about the act there. Basically, this is a yield policy for apples, and there was only, and if you look at the above the, the graph, we're talking about policies sold. There were only 22 policies sold, um, 23 policies sold on apples, and they were only, those were only for yield or multiple peril. There was field corn, uh, which had about 27 policies. Uh, fresh market corn is another kind of policy. Uh, it's a dollar value, just a kind of way of, again, uh, for fresh market sweet corn. And that's a as a as essentially again more closer possibly a little bit of a revenue projection really the value expected value of your corn so it does have a revenue component to it and there was only one policy no let's see fresh market corn there were three policies sold for that and nursery that's another big area of thing and this pasture range forage that was the one I was telling you about the forage the range index. It's an interesting 
form of insurance and it's becoming more pop popular because it deals with ensuring the, the forage that your ruminants will eat. Uh, there are eight policies, there were 14 policies. No, and I'm sorry, go across six policies of that. And then the other big one is a like yield policies for peaches, which was, it was to me, I had known that uh, peaches were being grown in New Hampshire and insured. But you can see, we are talking about 78 total policies, um, about $6 million in value being insured. This is going over here, liabilities, total premium, and then there's heavy subsidization, and there was about 176,000, at least as of this date, paid out in losses for these very few crops. As you can see, I was saying that the um, crop insurance is not highly utilized in the, in the New England area, and this kind of shows. But you get to show you what things are being insured. And so now we're going to go back, hopefully, to um, to to the uh, to my uh, PowerPoint presentation. And here we are back to that PowerPoint presentation. We're going to go on to the next. So another way, another thing to do is, is this, well, okay. Well, we know it's been insured in New Hampshire um, and it's not very much, uh, but what if I wanted to say, well, what have been the loss? What's the history of losses in my county? You know, if I'm going to assess my risk, I'd like to know at least historically what has been insured and, and how has that has it come about over the number of years. And so this tool was developed, uh, it's called the Ag Risk Viewer, and I really recommend utilizing it for your county. And I'll show you basically a, a way to do that. And you can see here, this is a screenshot of the basic uh, setup when you come in. And this is, uh, this is all the counties we're looking at the payments, indemnity payments. You can also uh, change these, but let's go into the tool itself first. Okay, hopefully. Okay, so this is the agro risk in a changing climate. It actually was designed by the Southwest Climate Hub, which is part of USDA program that looks uh, these club. There's ten of these hubs around the United States, and uh, one of them decided this was a good thing to do to help people assess risk. And uh, I think it's an excellent way. And I think with a changing climate, this might be critically important. So I'm going to load the viewer. You can take a tour and it will, might help you. So now we're being, this is an active map. And it starts out with payments. So all the indemnity payments made in the United States between 1989 and 2021. And as you can see, uh, we're talking about a billion dollars being the, the, the um, well, a billion 95. Anyway, there's some counties, these darker counties. Let's see where, again, where the darker the county, the, the greater the amount of total indemnity payments made out. Another way to make, look at this, make it a little bit easier other than the county, that was to switch this to state. And so you can see, this gives you, first of all, just a general overview of where losses, most losses have occurred in the United States through the federal crop insurance program. Now, remember, there's a little bit of a tricky here because we know that four or five crops dominate. And so they are more reflected in the data. And that's kind of what you can see. Um, I mean, other than California, which does have really high um, valued specialty crops and does have programs, but also has other commodity crops. But you can see, that these dark North Dakota, um, Iowa, Texas, and then even some of the Midwest in general, but can one of these are corn soybean prices, and they they generally take a lot of the insurance. Therefore, of course, they're likely to have had more indemnity payments paid out. And you can see, as I was saying, the New England area you know, over this period of time in terms of total losses, very light, because again, there's not as many types of policies available in every county. And all of that. Now you can you can also go over here and uh, and you can download some uh, some additional data, which I think is kind of interesting. So this little chart, little charts. You can go ahead and load this up here. And this will give you again. This is at the national level, and so it tells you like when the big years were. Remember the twenty twelve year. That's when a lot of that's when like a lot of losses. $17 billion indemnities that year alone. And you can see 
that the losses of generally, because those are the best policies, are going again to those corn, wheat, soybean, cotton, um, grain, sorghum, rice, and then a lot of others. So there's coverage and you can see how those played out and when the payments were made. I think this is the other thing that's kind of interesting. What has been the cause of the losses? Uh, cause of losses is critical to understand. So historically, it seems for the nation, drought, um, flooding, excess precipitation, hail, um, area plans is a county thing. That's not so useful. But I, I would point out this decline in price, um, $7 billion. That's when revenue, this shows you how important revenue insurance can be because you know there were losses that really were due. The cause of loss was not anything to do with the, uh, but was actually a drop on the price of those commodity crops that in, inspired a loss. And in many cases, it's higher than several other things that you would think might affect uh, losses in a greater way. So what's really also interesting about this is that you can uh, go to this map and you can go to specific states. And so we're interested in New Hampshire. Let's pull up New Hampshire here. And we can actually zoom in on it too with our little zoom map here. It's a really cool little tool. There's New Hampshire. We'll zoom in even closer to New Hampshire. And let's switch back to the counties now because we're not interested in here's New Hampshire. And let's go a little bit further in. And there's Cheshire County. So our case study we're gonna look at is in Cheshire County. I can pick on Cheshire County. So if I had a farm in Cheshire County and I was thinking about buying crop insurance, I could use this tool to say, well, what was insured in the past? When what was the cause of losses? When did they occur in the past? And as you can see, it, most of it, first of all, all of the things are all other crops. So again, uh, not many uh, losses related to uh, field corn, for instance. And, and again, there's variability. The losses change over years, some years a lot. You, know, you get back these years, there weren't hardly anything about, there was basically no insurance uh, for a lot of New England, which might be explain the history of why it's not as used as much. But I think this is probably the more interesting thing in terms of uh, this one county in New Hampshire is frost, freeze, hail. These seem to be the major causes of excess precipitation, drought. Again, you, you start to see, so, ah, so these are the kinds of things that I at least historically look like the things that might cause a loss. So this might make you think, well, I only need a yield insurance because I'm only going to have peril and therefore maybe peril, you know, some kind of peril with frost, therefore yield policy would be sufficient decline in price between, you know, might not be a significant cause of loss historically, again. And we're, we're talking about, you know, not very high levels of payment, you know, in 2021, uh, total uh, payments was only $66,000 in this one county of New Hampshire. And the highest level was 2012, again, that year when everything went crazy and nationally, 120,000 in payouts. And then way back 121. So there a couple of years in there where there were significant losses. Okay, now I'm gonna leave this tool, but but you can play with this tool and you can again you can you can go down to your county and you can see this data. And um, it's, it's it's just an interesting way to assess your risk. So now I'm gonna go and close this and go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, that's another tool to assess risk. trying to go to the next page and that's not moving. Where am I? Oh, there we go. Okay, now I'm gonna to turn to, a, I'm gonna to turn to a, a whole farm revenue protection is an option for New Hampshire. Whole farm revenue protection is something I've been working on for 19 years. Um, it's a product that used to be called adjusted gross revenue and adjusted gross revenue light. Again in 2007, I began exploring it in 2008. So it's been a long, long um, road for me to understand how this, and I was really excited about this program because it's a very different way to approach crop insurance. And in fact, it's really, in some sense, it's revenue insurance it's, and it's revenue of the entire farm. Uh, it doesn't really 
ensure what crops you're growing or products you're producing. It's pr produce, it's basically ensuring your capacity to generate a revenue. So if your farm has an historic capacity to generate, in this case, 170,000, let's say, uh, on average per year, uh, based on data, um, we will protect some percent of that 170,000 average into your year that you're going to insure. So essentially it's revenue insurance uh, and, and it takes away the idea that you choose the crops and products that you think will generate and the most revenue for you. And we're not going to basically only insure specific crops. We're going to say your farm has this potential, will insure its potential. And if you have a loss, whatever, some things might go up, some things might go but overall loss in terms of economic loss will insure part of that loss. So to give us income, rent, revenue insurance. Uh, and I think there's some important reasons why this makes it a significantly useful, um, and at least the idea of it, as a way to ensure crops that are highly diverse and where there's not better alternatives to ensure individual crops, which is kind of the case in New England. So AGR light, and then once we come whole farm revenue in 2014 is uh, I think probably ideally could be one of the best ways for uh, farmers and uh, farmers in New England to ensure their farms. It sure it now goes up to $17 million in revenue. I don't know if there's anyone in New England who has a farm who has historically on average produced $17 million in revenue, but if it did, it would be insurable under this program. And it's based on five years of historic revenue based on your tax record. So your Schedule S, which is the general form of tax payment, it gives an estimate of the revenue generated by a farm, you take essentially the average of those five years. There's a lot of more detail, but basically five years of that race. And then you get this, that's what the farm can, you know, has the capacity. And we'll say it's 150,000, 170,000. And then we'll ensure up to 85% of that revenue uh, through this program. And it's based on tax records. And if you don't use a Schedule F, uh, your insurance agent can convert that to the, what is called an equivalent Schedule F many people incorporate in different ways. And it basically covered, it's not so much about the products you produce. There's a few exceptions, but basically it produces, you know, you can grow whatever you want, produce whatever you want. And we're really going to protect your revenue. We're not going to protect and tell you or incentivize you to grow any particular crop because there's insurance for it, for instance. So there's also recently, and this is why I'm doing this because there's a micro addendum, which actually helps in making it a little bit easier for a really highly diverse farm to take advantage of the whole farm revenue. It's an addendum. That means that it basically is the same policy, but it's for a specific subset of potential farmers that could use, use this. It was only launched in 2022. So really this coming year is going to be interesting to see how many people are, uh, are interested in utilize this. And it's fairly new. so. And there's a lot of education going on right now. The risk management agency is doing a nationwide roadshow on whole farm revenue protection and the micro addendum. And I've been working on some uh, projects in New England even that uh, are looking at this as a viable way for, for crop insurance for um, New England farms. Um, it's really reduced some of the paperwork burdens of application. Um, and it generally, not perfectly, it simplifies the application process. Um, but however, it's not an option if you're adjusted approved gross revenues greater than 350,000. And so if, if you're a fairly larger farm, you're, you're on average grossing like 400,000, then this, this shortened version, this is a micro version is not available to you, but you can still use the whole farm revenue uh, policy more generally, which goes up to 17 million, I just, just said. And it needs at least three years of past revenue records. Now, three and five. The three is really if you're a beginning or a veteran farmer. Um, there, for those folks, you don't have to have quite as much of a history. Uh, basically, it's an incentive to try to help beginning farmers and veterans um, get into this insurance policy quicker. But normally, it's a five, you need five years of your past revenue history in those tax records, um, with the exception of those categories of folks. 
And the level of coverage is between 50. So you can choose the level of coverage of your adjusted approved revenue and up to 85%. So there's in a sense, uh, you can't get 100% of that adjusted revenue, that guaranteed level of protection. You only get 85%. So there's a in, built in 15, that's the max you can get. Uh, you have to be currently farming, US citizen, uh, or announces with documents. Uh, so these are some of the details of what who can use it uh, yeah, with int commercial intent. Uh, but you could be a nonprofit uh, uh, if you structured your business as a nonprofit, that's still, but you're basically in business to produce things, produce and sell farm products. Um, even if you buy and resell, um, you can have 50% of, of course, that won't be covered exactly the same way, but you can have that going on uh, as long as it's under 50%. Uh, and this is interesting. Um, if you want to use the micro addendum, you can't use any other insurance policies. This is the only one that will apply to you. This is not true for whole farm revenue in general, only for this micro addendum. If in fact you are higher than 350,000 and you're using whole farm revenue, you can actually insure individual crops with policies if available like say your peaches, and then you're growing other things, and then you could have an umbrella policy of the whole farm revenue for the whole farm that might that would include all the other crops. So you can mix and match uh, with whole farm generally, but not with a micro. Uh, and this is an, a, a kind of interesting thing for this policy alone, revenue from post-production processing or value added. So if you have whole farm revenue and you take your raspberries and make them into raspberry jam, um, and this causes a bit of paperwork, you cannot get insurance for the value of the jam, but you can get insurance for the value of the raspberries. And you have to break out that when you're calculating your historic revenue, the revenue that was generated from the value added product is not insurable under general whole farm revenue, but to simplify it for the smaller 350,000 gross revenue and lower, They've basically said, eh, we don't care. This is, uh, we'll just, we'll also include the value. And so you don't have to do that thing, which makes a lot easier if you, particularly if you have a lot of value added products, which sometimes some of these smaller farms do. So that's a great change and, and will make it a little bit simpler to do. Um, these are the two few things that aren't insurable under whole farm revenue or the micro addendum. Um, <laughs> these seems pretty non-farm products and a, and you basically your show animals that's not really agriculture products but essentially everything is it's it's amazing that different kinds of things that are included i mean everything basically all products except these and the basic products so is you get your contract your insurance agency usually in january february right now um there's usually a sales closing date for all the policies and the whole farm is no different. And in fact, it's still February when I'm doing this. So there's still time to uh, apply and look into whole farm revenue or the micro. And in New England, I think the date is about March 15th. Uh, you have to submit this thing um, called a farm operation for it initially. Then you have to revise it if there's any changes in what you've grown, because that often happens from the time you start to the time you're kind of going into the thing. Um, you've got to have your payment paid in full by August. And um, you must notify your agent of any loss within 72 hours. So if you have any, if you think think you're going to have some kind of loss with old farm revenue or even the micro, you know, work with your agent. It's really, really important to work with your agent. And you should... Pick your agent, uh, you know, agent that you can work with, who wants to sell this product, who will help you. You should not see your crop insurance agent as the enemy in any way. These are the folks you've got to tell them, I've had this really loss. The other thing is just protect yourself. It's, you know, we have phones now. Take pictures of your loss. Explain your loss. You know, even if you don't know for sure if that's a legitimate loss, just call them up and say, I had this thing. Does this cut? Is this, a, is this a loss under my policy? They should be able to tell you. And then, and it's like I say, it's important because when you get to be adjusted later on and you're making a claim, 
and you had you hadn't told your agent that you factored out these losses, then you're going to be up. It's going to be a, it's going to be a problem. And then you and again with whole farm revenue, you can't submit your final claim until after you filed your taxes. Why? Because again, the information of loss is based on on that historic rev on that revenue, and that revenue is reflected in your tax. So this is different. This is a big difference from uh, individual crop commodity policies in that the claims are paid much earlier as they in fact occur, but you have to wait longer to get payment, which can be significant if this if you have significant loss. So basically, um, if you're not owning the farm, you better you have to work with the person you're leasing from to make sure that. That you're they're okay with this and that works. It's just a relationship between you and your and the person you rent from. Um, you have to have again at least three of your most recent um, equivalent uh, schedule F's. Your tax form, your tax uh, things. You have to have that available to the agent or equivalent, and the agent will can take on it. You know, if you don't use schedule F, they can make it into an equivalent one, and that's their job. Uh, they're getting paid for that, so don't be intimidated. You don't have to do that work for them. Um, you have to have a, a farm operation report, it's called, but your plan production for the insurance. The, again, the insurance agent will help you fill out this intended farm operation report, it's called. Um, it's not too uh, hard. And when you do the micro, it's actually it's very simple, as you'll see. The uh, AIP, the insurance provider, the agent, of the IP may request additional records beyond Schedule F's to document your historic revenue. But this is a very important point. If they do so, if they say, ah, I don't think this is sufficient. These record, these tax records are sufficient and they are needed if beyond tax records are not strictly required by their right. So if, if, if your agent who is being representing an, an, an improved insurance provider, one of those 13 companies says, oh, I need more information. I need your sales records from blah, blah, blah. You, you know, they can ask for them, but you also have the right to say, why are they needed? And they need to give you an explanation because it is not mandated that they have to get this information. And don't let them fool you by saying, well, the government says we have to have this the government does not say the government says exactly in some sense the opposite it says you you know agent of the government in terms of your private company can ask for this information if you think it's necessary but it's not strictly required by this management agency again this again it's a public private thing it's not just a private insurance company and it appears that way when you're kind of working with them so the first thing they're going to do is how do you estimate the cost of these things? Well, the first thing is to estimate the improved revenue guarantee. So here, again, this is this example. I, we were talking, remember, that they expect 170000 in gross revenue in the insurance year. But let's look at their history. And this is, again, from the tax records going back five years. And this is for the 20, 20, 2023 policy. So we've got... Um, you know, a variable, pretty variable, you know, 2020 was a pretty bad year. And then it was a couple better years. Um, and of course they have a great hopes that they're expected is going to be 170. But if you look at the, um, if you looked at the, at the kind of the average, the historic average at 104, you know, 170 is going to be a challenge. You never did it in the last, last few years. so. So basically, the you know the RMA the policy says we're only going to guarantee the lower of the two of your expected and your historic, and then generally the expected is generally going to be higher. People uh, uh, expect it to do well, <laughs> but again, it's going to it's only going to ensure that thing. So right here you have a, an issue if you think about it. If your historic is 104, but your expected 170. If you really truly think you can get 170,000, you're and but they're only going to insure the 104 as the as your revenue guarantee. You could kind of think of that as a deductible as well. It's not really meeting my expectations of covering what I expect to lose, could lose if everything was lost. But but the counter argument is well, but we really 
don't look like you could generate $170,000 in gross revenue. Now, there are issues of, kind of expanding operations. If you've got acreage or other reasons why you're expected to spend a bit, there is, um, the policy does take note of that. It also will adjust your historic revenues. It'll let you drop off the lowest year and, and recombine. There's three different ways in which you can kind of smooth your variability of your history and the agent will work through those with you. But bottom line is that if your historic is significantly different than you're expected, that right there might be a reason why a person might not be interested because they feel like they're not getting adequate coverage. And that's up to you to decide, but these are just calculated calculations. So step two, choose a coverage level. As I said, you can cover up to 85% of that 104. So your revenue guarantee is 104,000. You're not gonna get 100% of the total loss. You, you wouldn't get 104,000, but 85%, if you had a total loss, you'd get 88,000. So, you know, if you go into the year, if you lose everything, the maximum payment you would get if you were covered at the 85% level would be 88,400. Again, so, so, so here's, here's the actual deductible as we think of it. But if, again, if you're approved, if you think your gross is under 70 and you're only going to get up to 80, 84,000, that's a significant amount of loss across the entire farm and revenue before you're going to see a payment. And again, is it worth it or not? Again, there's no easy, again, how risk averse, how, how, how likely do you think? Did you do your assessment of risk well to say, well, I've got the risky place to grow here, so maybe I need this coverage because, you know, 88,400, if I have a total loss, will keep me farming. And in some sense, I think that's what drives all of us, to, you know, to have insurance is, you know, we want we want to replace our house if it burns down. And we want to replace our vehicle if it gets it gets total an accident. We we want to uh, be able to keep farming. So step three: estimate the premium cost of using. And and I was going to. I, I think it's it, the RMA cost estimator is linked here. You can go online and uh, play with that. It's pretty simple, but. I'm just going to cut to the chase here and, and say basically this is what it would cost for this person who thinks he's going to get 170,000. His revenue guarantee is 104,000. He wants an 85% uh, coverage. It's going to cost the farmer 4,240. Now again, that's highly subsidized level. That's not the full cost of the insurance. That's a subsidized. That's what the farmer would pay. It's $4,240 to cover essentially up to um, $104,000, well, $85,000, you know, uh, you, you only get $85,000, $4,000. So you have to take the cost of the premium and the expectation of payout. And it's a, is it worth it? And, and you know it, if you drop to 80% coverage, the cost, cost is dramatic and then it, a lot less as you go. But again, you have to think about this, is, is the whole farm's revenue going? Say, say one of your products goes really up high and one of them really does wipe out, but the overall, it doesn't drop below that 85%, you won't see a payment. And people say, well, well why would I buy it if it doesn't pay out significantly? Well, I'll give you an example. I've been working with a farmer here in Montana and many years that was the case. He, he didn't have everything have a loss at one time, but this last year was horrible for Montana. And it was a big drought, and he had losses across everything, and it did pay out finally because everything finally went below his revenue guarantee. So we don't buy insurance with the expectation necessarily that our house will burn down, or our car will crash, or our health will be terrible, or our farms are going to have dramatic losses. It, the point is to have that in case you do, and and again, it's dependent on your risk aversion. You can think of this as a cost, or you can think of this as an investment on your capacity to farm into the future. So the summary of the case study is we got this approved revenue, the level of coverage and the costs. And it's always the lower of your historic and expected. So again, notice we never discussed which products were being grown, these 10 products, because in a sense it doesn't matter. Really, what this is about is ensuring the capacity of the farm to generate a revenue. And we are going to protect some of that capacity should for whether it's 
a loss in the market. This is a revenue policy. So if your prices go down and you don't generate revenue or the uh, flood kills all your spinach, and that's a big important part of your revenue, then you will get, you'll get a payment. But it's not, it, it basically says, go farm what you need to do to be profitable, which works best and keeps your risk minimum. We'll cover that based on looking at your capacity to generate a revenue. And again, another thing that we might is if your historic approved revenue uh, related to your expected revenue. Again, this difference is if, if the if historic revenue had been 160 rather than 100, you know, uh, rather than 104, that would meant that basically what his expectation, 170 and 160 are very close together. If they're very close together, 85% of 160 is close. So, so in a sense, whether whole farm works for you, whether it's the micro or not, is that to the degree to which your variability of your historic revenue is very close to what, you know, your capacity and what you expect are very close together, then you feel like you have less of a deductible and more of a coverage. But if they vary greatly, then your average will be lower and, and you might not think coverage is adequate. And again, one product can do better than the other, but, but it has to be the whole farm's decline. So, so many things have to decline that basically hit that whole farm's revenue loss. So, so pay, pay attention to that because that's very important. It's, it's not about any single crop. It's like what the whole farm revenue. And they must go through an adjustment loss that can be more complex to the, you know, so when you go to the adjustment and you claim a loss, it does take a while for the adjustment. Um, and it won't, won't begin until the taxes have been filed, delaying the payment, you know, for a while. There's, again, there's another, there's another policy that some folks in New England, I think, have been using. But again, these are based on single, on specific crops that are not insured through, um, it's called the NAP, the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance. It's developed and run by the Farm Service Agency, entirely the different agency of the federal government. It really was a, kind of a disaster payment type crop insurance. It functions basically like a crop insurance policy. Uh, it sometimes it would be difficult to cover the same number of products as the micro or as the whole farm revenue. And in my experience has been that the it's costly, it's more costly to purchase and, and it doesn't provide us the level of protection that the whole farm micro or whole farm revenue does. But again, it's, it's worth checking out as an alternative. Um, and it's a, but they're two different agencies and you're not working with a crop insurance agency. You're looking at working with FSA. Uh, again, the, the federal crop insurance program serves a large, it's excellent in revenue products, but less so for smaller products. Um, the exception of this um, diverse horticultural operations is this program. So I think for New England, the bottom line here is I think this has great potential. There are issues. There's still complaints about the paperwork. Um, one thing that did change significantly in this coming year is that historically you had to track your expenses as well as your income. And there was actually a penalty that if you expect, you know, if your actual expenses in the year insurance weren't uh, equal to about 70% of your historic expenses, you would be dinged in your payment. That has gone. It took uh, a number of folks working in the public policy arena to have that change. And it, for the first time this year, that's true. It took something like eight years of work to convince the RMA and the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation to basically not penalize people for not meeting some expense expectation. Didn't exist for any other crop insurance policy except this one, and now it doesn't for this as well. So that's a welcome change and has reduced paperwork um, significantly. So it should be it should be a lot smoother and easier to to use this product than it ever has been before. And again, New England farmers have a history of not depending on crop insurance at all. And so again, again, crop insurance is only one way to mitigate risks. Here are some additional resources that are available to you. Um, all of these are on a, this, these top two um, are on our ATRA website. Um, 
On the RMA website, you can also find a local crop insurance agent if you're not familiar with one. You can just look at the phone book too, but, <laughs> but anyway, I guess we don't have phone books anymore, but just Google, I, I guess, uh, crop insurance agent, but they have a nice location, a, agent locator system uh, on the website as well. And there's, um, there's a great uh, uh, organization called the Carrot Project and based out of Boston, Massachusetts, I've been working with them on the microdendum and they have, and they're doing a lot of education and a great webinar on the micro uh, po policy itself. So I check that out. And again, I'd, I'd just uh, acknowledge some of the funding for this with the Northeast ERE, uh, risk management program and the CARAT project. Uh, some of the information I used was from the presentation they did again under the same ERME I think um, the source of funding was the federal government for this work. And further questions um, can be directed to me directly at this number or email. Uh, this is a general after line or uh, after email, uh, and ask an ag. And if it's about crop insurance, it'll find its way to me and uh, be glad to help. Uh, thank you. And it's been wonderful talking to you today. Have a great day.